I love, okay, Mavs. I, I, I had a feeling you'd be in a Mavs mindset. <laughs> I got to rep, I got to rep. Do you have a game day ritual? I know your athletes do. Absolutely, I do. Because I get so nervous. And I get so intense about the whole thing. I got it, you know, I when I eat, what time I eat, and I'm stupid stitious, right? So I got to do it always the same way. Unless we lose, then I change it up. <laughs> I love it. And you can always, you know, you can, I can feel your, your energy is palpable when, you, when we watch the game's court and your court side. And I can just feel that, like, you know, it, it's, it's almost harder to, I imagine from your position, because at least the players are getting to play out their nerves. Right, I can't do feeling. anything. There's nothing <laughs> I can do. And it's so nerve wracking, right? Yeah. You know, people don't realize winning is fun, but the whole game is just so stressful. You know, it's like if I'm watching somebody else's game, I'm just watching basketball. Yeah. It's no big deal. If I'm watching my kids play, I'm just watching basketball. But when it's the Mavs and it's the Western Conference Finals, <laughs> it is nerve wracking. Just the whole game, I'm just at. Ah. I can imagine. Uh, so welcome to Hustlers at Home. This is yep. a series that I developed at the beginning of the pandemic because we were all at home and I wanted to know what are hustlers doing at home now that the world is opening up. Um, this is a special capsule collection where I'm really focusing on educating myself on Web3 NFTs and speaking sure. to legends uh, in the space and, you know, tastemakers and opinion makers and obviously more. Mark, I could, we could spend the whole interview talking about your bio. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to talk about so me at we all. Don't, we don't need to go through your bio, but obviously I'm a huge fan. I respect you so much as an Thanks. entrepreneur. And I know that a lot of your, your team hustles with me at Peloton and my teammates. <laughs> yeah, you and me um, both. Hey, I love your classes, the hip classes, the hip hop class. <laughs> you know, you get me going, so it's good. I'm in the process of, as a lot of us are, educating myself around Web3 and as a content uh, creator, and a community leader trying to get my, an understanding of like, what's what? And, you know, interesting in preparation for today's talk, I tweeted to my followers, hey, who's doing dope things in Web3? You know, specifically like, where are women and people of color in the space? Not only was it crickets, the responses were NFTs are a scam. And I was like, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion on that? I was so surprised by that response. So NFTs are just collectibles. They just happen to be digital. You know, if you go to the Louvre in Paris and look at the Mona Lisa, 99% of people are just going to say, that's just a picture of some old lady, right? <laughs> you know, that's been around forever and people have assigned value to it. You know, a lot and the 1% are going to think it's the most beautiful piece of art that they've ever seen. NFTs are the exact same thing. It's just you know, a collectible that happens to be digital. And the advantage of it being digital are several fold. One, you can't mess it up, right? You know, if you have a baseball card, if you have a poster, if you have a piece, an Andy Warhol piece of work, piece of art, you know, there's always that chance that something's gonna get screwed up. There's a, there's a famous story about Steve Wynn from Wynn Hotels in Vegas. And he had a $130 million piece of artwork he was going to sell. And he he tripped or somebody tripped and poked a hole in it, mm -hmm. you know? So there's always that risk. And, right. you know, with an NFT, it's digital. So there's no risk. There's no risk when you sell it. There's no risk when you transfer it. You can transfer it immediately. So if, if you create an NFT or I create one and you want to buy it, it takes about two seconds for the transaction to happen. So there's no transfer risk. You don't have to worry about the quality. There's, you know, we can go through a whole list of why an NFT has advantages as a collectible, but it always comes down to demand. Yeah. You know, art, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Value is in the eye of the beholder. Demand is in the eye of the buyer. And so if you can create an NFT that has demand, then it's going to be worth something. 99% of NFTs that are created, like 99% of art, like 99% of music, like 99% of the people who say, oh, I could teach that Peloton class and get everybody rolling, right? <laughs> it's not real, right? But for the 1%, the people who can do something special, then there's, there's a real market for it. And that's where the NFTs get their value. So what are you most excited about? What sectors, like, where do you think, I mean, especially with the recent crash, there's a lot of considerations, right? Um, people are really bullish on things that now they're scaling back from. So what are you excited about? In well, NFT? first, you know, 
with crypto, there's a lot of similarities with the stock market. There's yeah. an old saying that I've always had in the stock market that everybody's a genius in a bull market. Yeah. You know, where when, when stock prices are going up, everybody will tell you what stocks they're buying, right? When stock prices are going down, everybody gets really, really quiet. And it's the same with crypto. You know, when Ethereum and Bitcoin and some of the others are going up, everybody will tell you how smart they feel. But when they go down, you know, no one wants to say a word. And the reality is you have to look for the utility or the value of any investment that you make. You know, you have to say, why are people buying Bitcoin? In, in reality, Bitcoin, just like an NFT is a digital version of art, you know, we compared it to the Mona Lisa. Bitcoin is a digital version of gold. Right. Gold, you know, people say, well, gold has real value as jewelry. Nobody needs gold jewelry. Well, people I don't know. I don't people know. want gold. <laughs> yeah, I know, right, Leah, right? Yeah. Uh, no, but I hear you. I hear you. It's a, it's a commodity. Yeah. Yeah. People, people like gold jewelry because, you know, it, it keeps a shine, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of reasons to love gold as jewelry. But if, if gold jewelry went away, the world wouldn't change, yeah. you know, and there's only a really, there's a few manufacturing applications, but gold has value because people assign it value. And that's what those types of investments are called store of value. They're kind of like commodities, like you just said, Bitcoin's the same way. It just happens to be digital. It's limited by an algorithm and how many that's created. So there's a scarcity factor. You can't just create it forever. And because of that, and because it's easy to transfer, it's easy in some cases to use for cross-border payments between country, people in different countries. So there's some utility, but mostly people buy Bitcoin and own Bitcoin like I do because other people own Bitcoin, just yeah. like people buy gold. Now you hear a lot of stories. Bitcoin is a hedge to inflation. Gold is a hedge to inflation. It's not, it's not. You know, we're having a lot of inflation right now. Bitcoin ain't going up. We're having a lot of inflation right now. Gold ain't going up. You know, yeah. they, they've they bounced around pretty much where they are. And so you've got to understand if you're buying Bitcoin, it's a store value. And like any store value, gold or otherwise, it's the price is based on supply and demand. When people are selling, more people are selling than buying, it goes down. When more people are buying than selling, it goes up. And again, that's not a whole lot different than the stock market either. You know, tech stocks have gotten crushed worse than Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, yeah. Ethereum's a little, Ethereum's a little bit different, right? Ethereum has some level of utility where you can use it for transactions. Most um, NFTs are bought and sold using Ethereum. So, in order to buy a board ape for a hundred Ethereum, you have to go buy that Ethereum. And so, the more demand there is for board apes or the ape coin or whatever that's um, based on Ethereum the more value Ethereum, um, the token is going to have. And so when I look at any of my crypto investments, that's the first question I have. What is the core utility of it? What value does it serve? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I own more Ethereum than I do Bitcoin. Now that said, again, when, when all tokens like stocks have some level of speculators in it, right? People who aren't long-term investors, they just want to buy because they think it's going up. And yeah. so when a market loses those speculators and we're losing a lot of them now because interest rates are going up yeah. because if you, you know, when you had your choice of putting your hard earned dollars in the bank and earning 0.1% interest, you're probably going to speculate more. But now that interest rates are going up, people are speculating less yep. and you can't borrow money to speculate as inexpensively. So they speculate even less. And as a result, stock prices are going down. You know, I own Amazon, I own Netflix. Those prices have gone down more than my Bitcoin and my Ethereum have gone down. Mm. But that's just the way it goes. And so, you know, at this point in time, what I'm doing is looking to see, are, is there anything there that's gotten so cheap? that it's time to really take a strong look at starting to buy some. And I've dabbled, you know, when, when Ethereum gets down under, two, you know, under, let's say, $1,800, I'll buy a little bit. When um, Bitcoin gets down under $28,000, i will buy just a little bit because it's really hard to predict how low it's going to go. So I'm not, I haven't gone all in, in yet. Yeah, I heard that. And what role, okay, so but apart from, you're making analogies to the stock market, what are specific considerations that traditional investors should take when going into the Web3 NFT Ethereum game? 
don't do it one number one don't do it because someone told you it's it's hot it's cool it's you know it's the next big thing that never works right do it because you see a fundamental reason for it you know back in the day people when starbucks was just getting started people say well you know buy starbucks and i'm like why like because everybody i know is going to starbucks for their coffee right mm -hmm. that's a good reason to buy a uh, stock in a company and it's the same thing with crypto it's not because everybody's buying the crypto it's because they're using it for something that that creates value like i I've, I've invested in a, a, a crypto token called klima k l i m a and it's a dao that buys um carbon credits that you can then i can then use for my business to oh, then cool. burn them and, yeah. yeah now the good news is there's a utility there so i can say i'm offsetting my carbon footprint by buying them and burning them and that creates value the bad news is it's down like 99% because a lot fewer people are doing it. So even though in this particular case, it served a real purpose by allowing me to, you know, burn carbon credits and, and uh, um, offset my carbon footprint, not enough people are doing it. So the value still can go down, but I haven't sold any of mine because I think if it does, and it's still a big if, I, you know, I, you know, I say the odds are against it, but if it does catch on and people start realizing that, Hey, you know the um, the environment's important to me, and I want to offset the 20 tons of um, carbon that um, I create a year. This is, I think, one of the easiest ways to do it. So anybody, as more people become more confident and comfortable with crypto, buying you know Klima DAO token for five dollars, whatever, is a cheap way to do it. Or buying you know some of the other um, tokens that are affiliated with carbon. It's a cheap way to do it and burn it, which I think, you know, adds value to the token. So that's an example of, of utility. What va what role do you think DAOs will ultimately play in Web3? I mean, you know, and smart I look contracts. At DAOs, yeah, it's a great question. I look at DAOs and don't think of them so much as associated with Web3. Okay. I look at DAOs and say, okay, how can they change how company, how people do business? Right. Right. And so one of the big things that's happening right now is you know, employees are starting to get a little bit more traction and having an impact at the companies that they work for, you know, because at least as of now, there's more jobs than there are employees. And it's not hard to go, you know, leave your job and find another job, possibly paying even more. And companies are having to pay more to keep good people. Employees are getting more and more power. And that power is an example of why DAOs may start to have an impact in, in, in startups going forward. And mm -hmm. so I'm starting to talk to companies now that are saying, okay, rather than creating an LLC or rather than creating a subchapter S corporation and incorporating in Delaware, I'm gonna create a company as a DAO and I'm gonna pay my employees good wages because they need to be compensated but at the same time, I want them to participate more in how we govern the company. And so we're going to give them tokens and we're going to we're going to post things so that they can vote on different business decisions. Um, and so I think we're we're really just not even in the first minute of yeah. that industry and that happening. But I think that's the future of DAOs, where it may be a better way to do a startup that allows your employees to be more participant and contribute ideas and vote on ideas and make it more democratic, more progressive, more democratic. And if you start to see some companies achieve some success that way, I think you'll see more and more DAOs take place. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, I mean, it's the lawyer in me is like mesmerized by all of it, um, but it's the ultimate skin in the game, right? I mean, yeah, it's, exactly it's, right. You know, employers have got to recognize that their best employees are free agents. They always have options. And so, you know, I think as companies are structured, you've got to be able to take that into account. And so the lawyer and you is probably saying, okay, how's that all work contractually and this and that, and all those things are, are still being figured out, but I think they will get figured out. Yeah. And okay. So I have two, I have many, many questions. Um, the, who is doing it right from a content creation from like an NFT club creator standpoint, you know, we saw a lot of success recently at VCon, obviously Gary Vee is a genius. Um, but who as a digital creator, my mind goes to who's building community and how are we going to architect 
contribute to architecting this new world in a way that does not leave out women and people of color, especially right. folks, I, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this, but right. I have a community and I have right. an opinion on how to build community, but you know, that I'm trying to bridge that gap and knowledge and education have to be the, have to be the bridge. So I'll give you the bottom line on it. The hard part is not the community because there are a lot of communities out there. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Some are more committed than others, right? Um, and some of those commitments are because people have put their money in, so they have their choice, right? Oh, right. I bought this and I bought that, and so I'm going to be committed. The reality is the challenge for content creators isn't the first buyer. It, because if you've got enough followers and social media, if you've got enough people who really care about you, People will come in and you'll sell your first 100, 500, 1,000, sometimes even 10,000. But that's not the, the hard part in terms of being sustainable. The hard part is the second and third buyer. Right. right? So if, if I'm your biggest fan and you come out with an NFT that I just love, right, then that's great. I'll buy it. But my washing machine broke and I need to sell it. If there's nobody to sell it to, then the value, the floor... Yeah goes to zero. And all of a sudden, everybody's upset. So the challenge becomes, how do you create that second, third, fourth order buyer that sees value in it? And it could be just the quality of the art. It could be because there's utility. That's one of the things the Board Apes have done that's really smart, is they give you complete copyright access. You own the IP to that ape when, when um, you buy that Board Ape. And that's really smart. And they came out with an ape coin. And I, and I you know, um, I'm an investor with Guy O'Siri who invested in Yugo, who bought all the board apes and all that. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I love Guy. He, ri he runs yeah, the guy's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Guy's awesome. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll be clear on that, transparent on that. But um, at the same time, the hard part for them is creating ongoing utility. How do you yeah. get that? How do you give people that are the second or third or fourth buyer a reason to buy? And that's always the hard part. Like with the maps. If you come to a Mavs game, hopefully our next home game next week, if we win tonight, um, you'll get an NFT like we have for every home game so far. Now, it's free um, if you go to the game. You can't just buy a ticket and get it. You have to actually show up at the game and scan your ticket. And we work with Live Nation, who then um, creates a Polygon NFT that we create. We do the artwork for and we deliver it to the, the buyer of the ticket and the person who attended the game. And but we give that to them for free. We don't charge you extra because now if you they can't sell it, I think they went to the game, right? They got this NFT and it didn't cost them anything more. And if they can sell it to collectors, people who couldn't go to the game that want to, you know, expand their um, collection, then that's great. They can. And we create incremental value. So you know, we're, we're sending stuff to the people who have the, the biggest collection, right? So we'll send jerseys or this or that, um, or we'll give them free tickets to our preseason game or if oh, we have cool. extra tickets, right? So we're trying to create ongoing value. So in my mind, I don't want to be in a position where people's perception of the Dallas Mavericks or any content creator is based off of how the NFT is valued. Right. Because NFTs go up and down in value all the time. So the recommendation I've always made is don't don't charge for an NFT if you can at all help it. I mean, if you need the money, you need the money. If you're an artist and you're a content creator, a woman of color that, you know, isn't really appreciated for your artwork or other some of the other work you're doing and you're selling it. And that's you know, that's really the um, value proposition to the buyer. You know, this is amazing content. This is amazing art. And you're, you're helping to support this creator. Charge away, right? Because, you know, you're selling that piece of art. You're selling that, that education, whatever it may be, to the buyer. And they understand exactly why they're buying, right? right. That's and a if more they traditional can't art sale. Exactly. Yeah. And if they can't resell it, it, you know, they understood that going in. It's not meant... So that's different than a traditional NFT sale right now because people try to buy it and speculate it. If, if you're selling an NFT and the buyers are thinking they can speculate on it and the price is going to go up, that's probably, it's going to be really tough to work. And so the other thing I'll say, and this is where Gary Vee and I kind of differ, differ um, in our approach. 
I think creating a physical obligation is a mistake, oh. right? Yeah, because then you got to deliver, you know? So if you're selling um, NFTs to go to an event, it's great once the event is over, right? But if you're selling a year, two years into the future, just for, you know, the lawyer in you knows that that's the liability, right? The accountant will tell you that's the liability that goes in your books. And so now you may have sold a thousand or five or 10,000 NFTs, but if you're obligated to have, you know, a convention or you're obligated to release a book or you're obligated to do A, B or C, that's something that's sitting over your head that, you know, in inflationary times or who knows what else might change that if you don't deliver, you're going to have a lot of upset people and potentially some legal problems. Now, the exception to that is if you can deliver fully digitally. Like for me to deliver a Mavs ticket, it's all digital. I don't have to physically create something. The seats are already there, et cetera, et cetera. And we're only going to do it for games where we have open seats. You know, if I said that I'm going to send you a Mavs jersey and that's part of it, now I've got to go make those Mav jerseys and my expectations for what it would cost and deliver when I did it, it may be 10, you know, 10% more, 20%, 30% more expensive to deliver by the time I have to deliver. And so I'm not a fan of creating any type of del non-digital delivery obligation for any NFT, because that's just something, you know, you talked about during a Mavs game, how tense it is. Well, as a creator, if you've got to go and create more art, right, or you've got to go create, you know, some physical good or buy and, and deliver a physical good, that's just a stressful or like a startup, right, where you say, okay, I'm going to make this toaster and, you know, I'm, I'm taking all this money in from investors and they're expecting to get a toaster for that, that stuff and you can't deliver the toaster, right? right? You, you don't want to be in that position and at least in my mind. It sounds like we sh it sounds like creators should be under promising and over delivering Always. and being cautious as to what services or deliverables they're um they're able to deliver cuz then the oh, it's also a question of scale, right? Um you know, I've seen who do you think okay, so you mentioned board, board apes, who's doing it right? Like, you know, outside of the traditional art exchange where they, which I think is a very specific type of exchange. Uh, I'm thinking more like maybe membership or gaming or the clubhouses, like who's doing, or is anybody yeah, doing it right? It, it, it's tough right now. It's really, really tough right now because, you know, you've got to really, I don't, I don't know that anybody's doing it great, you know, because when you, it's like anything, it's like I'll, I've been around long enough to the early days of the internet, right? Where people would put up a website, raise money and say, they're going to do all these amazing things. And then the internet stock market bubble burst and nobody could deliver on anything. And so you've got to know as a creator, no matter what it is that you're creating, you've got to know the expectations of your buyer. And you've got to be really, really confident that you can meet those expectations because if you don't, then your brand is crushed. Mm. And now all of a sudden you went from being this amazing creative person to the person that yeah, I created this, you know, you, I trusted you, you created some amazing work, but you couldn't meet the expectations that you set. And it's because people don't fully understand how all this works that they, like you said, they overpromise and under deliver. And that's a real problem. And so, you know, if you're creating art, sell art, you know, sell it for the value proposition, sell it so that sell it to the people that appreciate your art. Like there's times I'll go on OpenSea and I'll see something I really like and it'll cost me $15, which is great because it's $15, you know, and then I've got a site um, that I created called lazy.com where you can just, you know, go to lazy.com, connect your NFT wallets and it shows up every, all my, so all my NFTs. So you can go to lazy.com slash mcuban. And now some people sent to me, but you can see all the ones that I've pinned that I've bought because I really like it. I think it well, represents that's your whole, me. Is that your whole, that's your wallet? That's your collection? Yeah, that's my, that's my whole NFT collection. Yep. Cool. And so, yeah, so just lazy.com slash mcuban and you get to see all of them. And, you know, some of them I think represent me and some of them I think, you know, I, I'm trying to support somebody who I think is brilliant um, or somebody that I think has a, has a chance to become brilliant and is on their way. And I'm spending, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, $50 for an NFT, 
I don't care if it goes up in value or not, because my expectation is I just like to look at it, you know, and I like supporting the person that I'm buying it from. And if that's the expectation you set, then you're always going to be good. And it doesn't have to be art. It could be poetry. I met somebody who just sells poetry, hakus, you know, it, it, anything, rhymes, just something that makes people feel good. It's okay to charge them. And, and so in that particular case, create an NFT, you know, set the royalty to 25%, put it on OpenSea, show it on lazy.com. So you can put it in um, your profile and, and Instagram and Twitter and wherever, and people you can just link and connect. And you're good. You know, that that I think is the right way for people to do it. And so are, are, have you been deep in discord? Like I see a lot of the, you know, a lot of the community building happening in discord. Are there, which to me feels like yet another app that I'm now engaging yeah. with. Yeah, I know, there, Telegram, <laughs> discord, yeah. Are there other avenues of, you know, community building and kind of that that chatter that you've witnessed beyond Discord? Or is that really okay, where it's so at? Here's what I'll say about Discord. It can be really, really good or a nightmare because where it's really, really good, it's a controlled, um, controlled community where there's somebody who really understands how the platform Discord works because Discord is not the easiest platform to operate. No. You know, I've set some up and you've got to really dig in to understand how it works. And I've screwed up many, many times. And so I'm in there kicking people off left or right that are stealing <laughs> this or scamming that. And because people will come in and, you know, just try to scam people um, or, or rip them off. And so you have to be careful. And, and it also, be, you know, gets a lot of the discourse where they're trying to pretend they have a big community. They'll use bots and everything. Oh. And they'll say, oh, we've got 15,000 people in here. And, you know, there's maybe a hundred people that are truly part of the community. And, you know, you've got to really, really know what you're doing and get somebody up to speed on discord and how the server upgrades work and the level ups work and all that stuff. But when it works well, it's really, really good. Mm, yeah. I participated in the world of women one. I've, I've enjoyed the conversations, but it's as a, as, as a creator, it feels like, oh my gosh, like I would need a real trusted community manager to partner with before I would ever put my name and stamp on that. It's really, really tough, right? Because if you as a creator don't get excited about going into your Discord or Telegram chat group every day because you want to communicate, then you probably shouldn't be doing it because it's got to be a two-way street where you get to connect with people. Absolutely. Um, and that that's key. Okay, so let's change topics. I'm curious, um, you're, you're a very publicly, globally, famously a shark. Yeah. What is um, What are qualities of an effective pitch? Like somebody who's watching and they're like, I, you know, everybody from their couch is like, yeah. I can pitch Mark. <laughs> what are the qualities of And they of do, the pitch? and they do everywhere, <laughs> right? The bathroom, the street corner, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, you know, the key to me is knowing why you're in business and why you're going to be good at it. You know, lots of people, we've all had that moment where you got that idea, right? Bam. Oh my God, this could be a cool idea. Then you get that feeling in your stomach where you're like, wow, I think. Then you look on Google, there's nobody who does this. Then you tell a friend, they're like, what a great idea. I'd buy one. And then people stop. Yeah. Right. Because. Because the hard part is, you know, just like starting this podcast or doing any of your businesses is the execution of it all, right? It's, you know, like going to law school, then taking, you know, passing the bar, right? Going to law school is one thing, passing the bar is a whole nother. Having the idea is one thing, executing on the idea for a business. So for me, it's how in depth have you done your homework? Because you've got to realize there's somebody who's going to be competing with you 99% of the Definitely. time. It's rare that there's a business that has no competition. And those people are just trying to kick your ass. If you compete with me in one of my companies, I'm trying to kick your ass. I don't care. You may be nice and we can have a drink, but I'm still going to kick your ass. <laughs> and it's because I'm going to put in the time to learn my business inside and out. And if you find yourself, like we talked about the Discord, if you don't eat, sleep, and drink your business 24-7 because that's how much you love being part of it, you're, you're probably not right for me as an investor. And, I've made, and I say this because I've made so many mistakes. You know, I, I've gotten it wrong, gotten so many investments wrong um, that I've learned what, what to look out for. 
What lesson was was the lo- the hardest for you to learn? What lesson took the longest? <laughs> or are you still Trust. still trying to learn? No, I'm still learning all of them, right? I'm still learning a lot, but um, and fortunately enough of work that to balance out the ones that didn't. But right. you know, for me it's trust because I tend to be a trusting person. And so I've had people rip me off, you know, or lie to me and you know, et cetera. And that's the hard part because I want to believe that you're a great entrepreneur or there's a great entrepreneur brewing inside of the people I'm talking to. And, you know, if you're able to demonstrate to me that, you know, this is a business that work and you put it works and we'll put in the time. Um, and then all of a sudden I find out you lied to me. That to me is the biggest heartbreak and, and where things go the further South. Um, and it happens. Look, I've invested in hundreds, probably more than a thousand companies at this point in my career and, you know, a thousand, one percent is still 10, you know, and that 10 is too many. But some of those lessons were painful. And what are you most excited about right now? Like, I mean, I like crypto, right? I mean, the crypto stuff is exciting for me, but I like it more for business applications, you know, oh, okay. for content. Yeah, for content, it's going to be great. I'd like to see textbooks, you know, college um, textbooks done as an NFT where you can take like a Kindle reader and, and make it part of an NFT. And so. You know, you take your class, um, you, you take uh, L1 class in law school and all the books you have to read. If they're an NFT, when you're done with it at the end of your, your semester, you just sell it. And the author and the publisher get their share and you don't have to go through all that hell of, okay, do I buy a new one, a used one? You know, what do I do with it now that I just spent $300 for this stupid textbook that I'll never use again? So there's a lot of valid applications there. Um, I think in business, we talked about DAOs and how they may change how businesses are started. Um, I think that the distributed aspect of um, approval, right, the centralization aspect of it. So things like um, um, insurance approvals, right? Right now, it, you know, insurance is very vertically integrated. So, you know, you, you buy your insurance policy or have your insurance policy. And then you got to go through your pre-approval. And if they don't get give you the pre-approval, you go to their boss and their boss yeah. and their boss. When a better way to do it would be in a decentralized manner as part of a DAO where you've got, you know, a thousand nodes who are trained on how to approve or disapprove an insurance claim or pre, pre-claim. And you just let them vote. And yeah. if, you know, 51% say yes, it's approved. And if not, not. And so there's a lot of unique applications, I think, that that are going to come to play. You know, I'm I'm talking to one company about taking legal, you know, we talk about smart contracts, but as a lawyer, you know, it's not a contract. It's just a software program. Right. And, but, you know, is there a way to incorporate a legal document into a smart contract so that if you want to convey, let's just say you created your own NFT and you want to create, convey certain IP rights. There's no reason why you couldn't create an actual contract that is standardized for the 10,000 NFTs that are created that are integrated into that smart contract. So that if there's a question and it goes to a court of law, it's answered because when you bought that token and you conveyed your approval for the, the legal document that is incorporated into the smart contract, then there's, I think that is an opportunity um, for, for a real business. And so I'm looking for those types of things where we apply web three decentralized principles yeah. to how things are being done in regular business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more, you know, creating the, those frameworks that make it much easier for the consumer to, you know, I mean, that is the DeFi. I mean, that is the decentralized model, right? It's like cut right. the fat, cut the side so- and create, cut the walls and the ceilings. And let's just- Yeah, you it- don't want, because right now, you know, I got a lot of money, right? And if I go to, if I want to borrow money, I still got to go to the bank and I still got to talk to a banker and I still got to sign forms and all that stuff. And so I have money on DeFi platforms like Aave, where, you know, if I want to get 10,000 USDC because there's something I want to buy and I just put it on a credit card, you know, that I have, I can just borrow it, you know, and send it to that credit card to pay for whatever it is that I'm paying. And then pay it back whenever I want to, you know, just paying the interest along the way. And it takes me about 30 seconds, you know, so just the simplification of DeFi is really the value there. So let's, I know you're a dad and your, your, um, your girl is graduating, right? How are they, the way they're consuming content is, is fascinating to me, right? Like they're, they're watching 
the Mavs game in 20 second sound bites. You know, yeah, it's, it's really TikTok. like TikTok, TikTok, YouTube, YouTube, a little bit of Instagram. That's it. That yeah. is it. I mean, my, my daughter and my son, my 15 year old and my 12 year old in particular, have kind of grown up on TikTok. You know, it's been around long enough now um, where they, it's just swipe, 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 swipe. And their algorithms know so much, they know what they like. In some respects, it's good. My, my son has learned about business and hustling and this and that because, and, and basketball. And, and my daughter um, watches, is more eclectic. And my 18 year old isn't on it nearly as much as she was. When, when TikTok was more dance driven and she and I, or just her could get on there and do dances. I saw, she was a lot I, more I saw you post a few dances, I think earlier in the video. You know what I tried to, I try to get them both to do them again with me and they won't. I don't know if it's me or TikTok, but <laughs> you know, but I love that stuff, right? Cause it was a way for us to connect, but you know, that's how they consume content. And that's just the reality. And, you know, I used to think it was bad in a lot of respects. Like I'd go to them and say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll get you a new pair of Jordans. If you read a 300 page, two, 300 page books. And my middle daughter would do it because she wanted Jordans that bad, but my youngest and oldest didn't care. Um, but I learned that they, you know, via YouTube and, and even TikTok, that's how they learn. And as long as they're paying attention to the right subjects, yeah. you know, that they can learn. And so it's me that has to evolve and adapt, not them. Classic Marshall McLuhan, right? The medium is yeah. the message. I mean, it's classic. A hundred percent. A great analogy. It really, yeah. really, really, really is. So you mentioned your son is learning how to hustle. You uh, you had a hustler spirit since you were like 10 years old. You know, yeah. I, when I was reading your bio, I was like, oh my God, he was a baby hustler. What wh how, What is your relationship to the word hustle? It's one, of, it's one of my faves. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, it's just like the song grinding all my life, right? I mean, that's, that's me to a T. I mean, you know, neither one of my parents went to college. Um, my mom was 20 when I was born. And then, you know, my dad did upholstery on it on cars his entire career. And so anything I wanted, it was always, okay, you got to figure it out. And that's all they needed to tell me, whether it was, you know, selling baseball cards when I was nine, selling garbage bags door to door, selling magazines door to door. So for me, hustling is, and grinding have always been just about the process, right? Find, you know, whatever, whatever I need to accomplish, finding a way, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out a way. And, and I was fortunate because I learned how to sell when I was young. And if, once you know how to sell and have that confidence, you're always going to have a job and you're always going to find a way to pay your bills and, or at least come close to paying your bills. And, and that that's worked out to me. And it's the same thing applies now to me. Hustling today means learning where other people don't take the time. Yeah. You know, there's, so, you know, all the things we just talked about with Web3 and tokens and, you know, two, three, three years ago, I didn't know 99% of that. I had to put in the time to learn it. And literally, it takes a lot of time. It's not something where, you know, you just, you know, watch some videos and you've got it all figured out. You've got to dig in. You've got to understand how smart contracts work. You've got to understand what decentralization is, how a DAO works. All those things we've talked about, to me, that's hustling. To me, yeah. that's grinding. That's part of what you have to do to win a business. Definitely. Okay. So last two questions, who inspires you? Like who oxygenates Mark Cuban's world? You know, my dad passed away a few years ago and up until then it, it was him, but now it's my kids. You know, it's just every minute of every day they put, well, I would say every, but they're, they're the bright light, you know, I'm not saying there's no hassles or grief <laughs> when you have three teenagers, there's plenty, but um, yeah, my kids definitely are my bright light and get me excited and, and really are, are the reasons I do you know, impact almost all my decisions. And that wasn't always the case. You know, when they were, you know, 15 months old, like I said, you know, they, they weren't, they, they were little, little bites of dust, you know, and, and not really, they're still on my heart, but it wasn't the same. Now they're real people. And, you know, I can have real conversations and I can learn from them as much as they learn from me. And that's inspiring. Amen. And um, last question, what would you say to the person who's watching this and is just feeling racked with paralyzed by fear and imposter syndrome? Have you ever had those experiences? Like, what are your relationships? Oh, fuck yes. 
Are you? I have imposter syndrome every single day. Are you kidding me? You don't know anything until you know, right? And I, you know, I've walked into rooms where I've looked around and everybody is like a world recognizable name and face. And they're asking me questions and it's like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> what did I step in the middle of? Right. And, you know, but it, it motivates me just to do the work and, you know, and, and you, and you've learned this too. I mean, you know, there might be names that you recognize faces that you recognize, but they put on their pants the same way you do, you know, and, and there's no difference. And every single person in that situation has the same doubts that you do. And the people who don't have doubts are the people who get their ass kicked first. Because if you, if you don't question yourself, if you don't, you know, wonder whether you've done enough, then you're not doing enough, you know, and you're probably narcissistic and you've probably got all kinds of other issues, right? Because there's nobody I know that's been truly successful that hasn't questioned themselves every step of the way. And that's one of the things that motivates them. Yeah. You know, how can I do better? How can I be better? How can I learn more? How can I feel, how can I make people around me feel better? Or what can I do to help? And what can I do to help myself? Yeah. You know, and, and we all go through those question marks and we all question ourselves and whether we're qualified to be here, to be on this podcast, whatever it may be, you know, and you just, I mean, I, I, I remember being broke, sleeping on the floor, wondering, you know, if the bill collectors would ever stop calling and, you know, and, and being in that situation and just telling myself, just keep grinding, keep grinding, keep grinding. And then finally starting a business that work, started to work and telling myself, okay, you've been in business one month, just be in business one more month. And then, okay, you've been in business two months, yeah. just be in business three months, right? And then who knows where it'll take you. And so, you know, what I'd say to everybody is everybody questions themselves and everybody wonders, you know, how they compare. Everybody compares themselves to other people, whether or not they can compete. But the reality is you have to take that first step. Yep. That's it. The hardest part isn't the last five steps. The hardest part is the first five steps because most people think they can't do it. But you just, you know, if you're prepared, you'll know when and then just go do it. And and uh, that hustler's mindset also has a healthy dose of curiosity, right? And, <laughs> and I think- You know what? That's a great word. Take the next leap. I would say confidence is a side effect of hustle. So you have, you take one more little nibble of hustle, one more, one more, and then it gives you like that, you know, that- You said it better than I did. The, yeah. the willingness to go one more step. Mark, thank you so much for being on Hustlers at Home. Where can people find you besides courtside at the maps? <laughs> yeah, you, you can find me on social media at MCuban. Um, you know, on Instagram and on Twitter, that's where I hang out most, I guess. And then um, you can, oh, let me put it, you can find me on lazy.com slash mcuban. And let me put in one plug for one of my, my new businesses. I um, uh, started a company called costplusdrugs.com. Oh, yes. So, I, read, I heard about this. Yeah. I'm, an, yeah. I, I'm on insulin. I'm a type 1 diabetic. So my ears perked up. We're with, working on it. Yeah, yeah, we're working on it. So hopefully, you know, knock on wood, we'll have something there um, over the next 12 months. But, and the name again? Um, costplusdrugs.com. If you have a prescription for any medication, go to costplusdrugs.com. What we do that's different, we cut out the middleman and any drug that we sell, we sell for cost plus 15%, plus $5 for shipping, plus $3 for pharmacy fill, and that's it. And so we have cancer, we, we have 800 plus drugs and our costs are usually 60, 70, 80%. They're usually less than your copay. Wow. So you're going, you're working directly with the manufacturers to get this yeah. done. So we buy from the manufacturers, whatever the drug may be. And then we just mark it up 15% and sell it directly that way. Um, we don't take insurance yet. And so, but at the same time, people with insurance use us because you might have a $20 copay and we're going to be less than your copay. Oh, wow. Okay, great. That's amazing. So, well, thank you for changing the... <laughs> <laughs> we're trying yeah the pharma we're, industry we're um amazing mark thank you for ha thank you for being on the um pod today on hustlers at home and it, it was really an honor speaking with you you're such an inspiration yeah this was fun thank you so much thanks for having me <laughs> appreciate it